always yearning for fresh faces on the political scene. Well, this is a fresh face, no doubt. The Dan York State of Mind program is brought to you at part by Lookout Rhode Island and Taco Comfort Solutions. Uh, Dr. Daniel, Luis Daniel Munoz is my guest tonight. Who's he? Right. Well, he's a candidate for governor and I'm looking forward to speaking with him. He had an announcement yesterday. He's a doctor and he's developed some technology in the medical field and has his own business and is a Central Falls grad and is a resident of East Greenwich and I don't know anything else about him. So together we'll learn. Welcome in. Thanks for tuning in to My State of Mind. Lots going on on a Tuesday evening, no doubt. Uh, let me start with this headline. I don't know when this case is going to resolve, but I spent four hours this morning at the Kent County Court. Principal rejects deal on charge. She didn't report sexual assault allegation. This is Violet Lamar, who was the principal of the Kazarian Elementary School and who got jammed up in the last school year over not reporting in the proper time frame, the statute calls for 24 hours, um, sexual abuse allegations that the kids reportedly had against a gym teacher. Uh, went to the court today to see how this case was going to play. She turned down a six-month probation offer from the state. Obviously, she wants to clear her name. And so they looked for, they, the defense, looked for a dismissal. And her attorney argued the dismissal on the vagueness of the sexual abuse statutes. And I was thinking, why? Uh, the state, in a lengthy rebuttal, more or less gave the old, if it looks like a duck and quacks like a duck, it's a duck. Like, you know what sexual abuse is when you hear about it or when a little one brings it to you to discuss it. And the case moved on. And so the first two witnesses were little ones, uh, now 12, then 11-year-old girls, who recounted how they experienced what they thought was sexual abuse. They don't use the term, just inappropriate touching and the like of breasts and, and, and what would be determined to be grinding, if you will. It, it, it was just an awful thing. One of the girls cried and the other, I mean, they're very upset, traumatized to this whole thing. And I'm, I'm just trying to figure out why we're in this place. The, the judge, uh, in, in not accepting the dismissal request, Judge Carullo, uh, admitted that the statute is murky. Uh, I'm talking about the reporting process. This principal reportedly reported up the chain. There were six people between her and the superintendent who wrote a report about the whole thing, and she's got criminal charges she's facing in district court. I'll do the best I can to continue to follow this case, but um, it is definitely a precedent-setting case, and I admire this principal for trying it. Uh, rather than just taking the deal and running away. We'll see how it goes. All right. Uh, the governor set to do her state of the state budget address. I don't know. We call it different things depending on, on the moment. Uh, I think we have a headline on that. Just more or less speaks for itself. Um, as you're watching the show early, the governor probably has already wrapped up. If you're watching the show at, on Fox at midnight, you are, uh, you've probably seen reports about it. We will follow this tomorrow. We'll discuss it tomorrow. We have yet another gubernatorial candidate on tomorrow. Lex, who we have in tomorrow? Giovanni, Giovanni Ferrosi, the uh, controversial Republican, will be here tomorrow. I'm sure he'll be reflecting on that. In fact, the gubernatorial candidates are stacking up here uh, along with the governor herself and uh, the Speaker of the House and the Senate President. They will be on next week, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, respectively, here on Dan York, state of mind. In the meantime, we have a new young man who is running for governor. Here's the headline. Uh, yes, launches the bid yesterday, and here's a little bit of the highlight. It is on this day that I, Luis Daniel Munoz, announced my candidacy for governor of Rhode Island to raise up Rhode Island families, to confront political corruption in the state that we live in, to improve our education systems, to ensure that high school education not only advances our youth, but provides them with skills where they can rise out of their means after high school, 
not solely after college. The things that I've learned in my life haven't only been as a result of my merit. It's a community that's raised me up, and I've come back to raise that community up. All right. Well, here he is. Welcome. Congratulations you so on much. your decision. Thank you. I say that to all candidates because it's not an easy thing to do to decide to run for governor. It hasn't been. But this is a serious bid. It is. You are uh, a 32-year-old guy who's a, you, you were a practicing doctor at one point, yes? No. So after medical school, I immediately went into industry. So essentially, I took two years to conduct a clinical research. Oh, because I got a cold. I was going to have you check me out, <laughs> but that's not, that's not, not going to happen. I'm not the guy. Okay. Um, but no, I, I essentially made a decision to go into the technology industry because of impact. Ultimately, I saw the technologies were advancing quickly, and in many cases, the adoptability of those technologies weren't as fast, and I felt there weren't enough medical doctors in the field of technology. And so I took the knowledge I had gained and created a solution that would help patients, specifically in, in, in this case with, di with diabetes, which is certainly something that many people are affected with today. So what is the exact technology? So we essentially use lasers to scan tissues. And in diabetes, uh, there are instances where patients who have uncontrolled diabetes develop uh, ulcers or tissue damage in their feet. And it's hard for the physicians to see what tissue is alive and what tissue is not. And so with our technologies, you, you can differentiate live tissues from not live tissues using lasers. Which does what? Get you closer to a it, diagnosis or it, a cure? Well, you know, cure right. is a funny thing when it comes to diabetes, right? Oh, so. yeah. Healthcare is complicated. It's co uh, coordination of care. Uh, so there are many physicians that help diabetic patients. Uh, the surgeons are, of course, the ones that deal with dire situations such as gangrene. Um, so in the case of evaluating dead tissue versus live tissue, what you want to do is make sure that there's not more dead tissue because if that's the case, you want to refer them over to surgery as soon as possible. Okay. So yeah. how's your business? So it's a small, it's a small company. Uh, we took the technology essentially to a stage where now it's going through a compliance review for regulatory approval. That's the longest stage in a medical device uh, company and now we're partnering with larger firms that have the distribution and the, the speed to propel it into the market to help patients faster. Are you earning a living with this project? So I do uh, consulting. Uh, it's not a deployed technology yet so if you're asking if we're actually selling if it's on the shelf. I'm just trying to figure out how not. you pay your bills. That's you know yeah. that, that's you know you're you got a family and yeah. the whole thing going on so you know, the basic question is, what do you do for a living? The technology thing and the research and the entrepreneurial effort is something that's really cool, but um, mm -hmm. what's paying for itself? How, how yeah. have you made as, a living? As you can imagine, um, being a medical doctor, having the knowledge I have, the experience in building a company, it, it gives me opportunities in consulting. Okay. And so I take those opportunities as they come and, and help others build businesses and, and move their lives forward. All right. Uh, live in East Greenwich. Yes. Graduated from Central Falls. Yes. Um, college where? Rhode Island College. Okay. And medical school where? University of Connecticut School of Medicine. All right. Uh, governor. Out of nowhere? I've spent a year uh, thinking about this, speaking with people around the state, families, uh, individuals, entrepreneurs, students. And uh, my discussion started with a reflection on what has happened over the past three years for Rhode Islanders. Have, have policies and opportunities as relate to work and education, have they really changed in such a way that it's giving more people the opportunity to have a journey that I've had? And, and I truly believe that I've been blessed. Uh, now the second question was, you know, what do I bring to the table? And, and frankly, the perspective I bring from growing up in Central Falls, the passion and love that I have for Rhode Island, uh, the executive experience that I've gained and business experience that I've gained as I've managed the company and of course worked with engineers to bring this technology together. Well, all of those things contribute in many ways to the, the vision that I believe Rhode Island um, should have in terms of creating a talent pool that actually um, meets the demands of industry and, and, and by virtue of that helps families in the state rise up out of their means. You're going to run as an independent? I am. Because? Because I've always been unaffiliated and frankly when I when I assess the parties and think about uh, what they stand for, it's not so much that being fiscally conservative is not the right thing to do. Of course, you need to manage a budget, and that ultimately protects families, uh, I think, in the end. Um, and it's not that uh, educational reform and giving uh, ways in which people can attend college uh, is good, but the parties ultimately have made decisions to draw a line, and those lines, in many ways, are disenfranchising many Rhode Island families from believing that they're going to have access. And I think 
over the past three years, or especially two, there's been evidence that the progress that's been made in terms of bringing companies to Rhode Island is not necessarily um, Co, you know, kind of come together with Rhode Island's Rhode Islanders actually having those opportunities, you know, getting jobs in that are inaccessible because of the talent pool that we currently have or don't have. That's not necessarily progress for Rhode Island. That's outward progress, perhaps something that looks great on a newspaper. All right. Well, clearly, uh, we got ourselves an articulate uh, young professional on our hands here. What happens to cause him to want to run, and how when we come back? Stay with us. There she is, our governor, the state of the state, budget address, whatever, tonight. And of course, we're heading into Time Flies and you're having fun. Little did I think years ago that Gina Raimondo would be defending her gubernatorial status. Actually, to be honest with you, I, I had a good feeling that by 2018 she would have been long gone uh, working in the Clinton administration somehow. But that didn't happen, did it? Um, so we have, a, we have quite the field now. We've got to start building uh, a, a chart for all of the folks that are in this race. We've got the governor as a Democrat, perhaps Link Chafee, perhaps Link Chafee running as a Democrat. We have uh, Alan Fung as a Republican, Patricia Morgan as a Republican, Giovanni Ferrosi, he'll be here tomorrow night as a Republican, Joe Trillo as an Independent, and now you join the Independent field here. Uh, it's getting crowded. What's in your system? Do you have a political family, focus, friends, environment that causes a young 32-year-old successful guy to say, I'm going to run for governor in the midst of what seems to be building a high-tech business? What's that all about? It matters to me. It matters to me. You know, I, I hear Did you ever run for office before? No. So, so re really what I can say is, my whole life I've had a drive for public service. Pursuing medicine and pursuing high impact technology are elements of that drive. Uh, with that said, um, I think that uh, earlier in, in, in my career, you know, I think I was convinced that there was this ladder uh, that you had to climb. And frankly, I will say, I knew that I needed to learn more. And so I continued to learn. And then I went into industry and I continued to learn about e the economy, regulations, how businesses are built. And as an individual, I got to a point where I realized that I knew enough. And then it just so happened, just so happened that at this time in history, at this point in time for a state that I love, I realized that families were not being looked after. And, and a lot of people say my family, frankly, when any family in Rhode Island is ignored or just is not able to access opportunity or frankly is not heard, and whether it's the governor or candidates are not empathetic, uh, to uh, their plight, well, that that ulti you know that empowers me to or empowered me to essentially decide to to begin the process of asking, asking what questions of speaking with people, of determining you know what is it that you're not getting. So you've been on this informal tour, or is it just you know wherever you hang out, you're bringing the conversation up? No, I'd say I've been on an informal tour for the past for the past year now. Was there a moment? I'm running. That's it. I've had it. Or that's it. Got to fix it. Or that's it. I got a vision. I'm running. The moment I decided the tour, I knew I was running. Now, are there moments within that that you take a step back? So you've known for how long you're running? You announced yesterday. I've known for a year. You have? I've known for a year. All right. Um, but I think it's important to have information and to be able to synthesize solutions before making a decision. You trying to make to a run. point with this with this candidacy, or are you running to win? It's not an awareness campaign. I, I want to win, and I want to help Rhode Island families have more opportunity and do better for what themselves. What are the families not getting? What, what's what's the void? Right. So if we're starting uh, in terms of business opportunities, it's, I mean ultimately it's jobs. I know that you know unemployment may be down relative to labor jobs, but that's not uh, a sustainable industry. Uh, in times of economic uh, uh, challenges. Uh, we, we need in Rhode Island our jobs that are sustainable, jobs that are going to outlast the next How do we recession. Get them? We get them by focusing on, on bringing in either the right companies that are going to have a return on the investment we make, and return being jobs and immediate resources into the communities that they're going into, or 
more of an investment and a shift over to small businesses. What's wrong with the way the governor is doing it? The governor is really focusing on large corporations. And as, as an example, you know, I'm, I'm a numbers guy as well. I mean, I have my empathy and my emotion, but ultimately I'm very analytical. And when I look at a GE uh, as this major change for Rhode Island, what I, what I realize is, well, that's, that's a company that streamlines manufacturing. And you know, what are 50 jobs from GE? Well, what do those jobs look like? And are they jobs, or, or is it a, a segment of GE that's uh, expandable, that can scale and create more jobs? And frankly, what's been communicated and, and what's happened thus far doesn't prove that to be the case. I've challenged the governor with the way she picks winners and losers. Do you share the same thoughts? I do believe that the focus on... Do we need a more broad-based tax incentive policy that's equitable and attainable and accessible for any business? I guess that's what I'm asking. I think we need to draw a line between how we interact with corporations that are 500 plus employee corporations and then small to medium sized businesses. And ultimately we, we should have favorability to Rhode Island small businesses above all others. Business retention you're talking about? Well, retention in part if you're thinking about Drive-It for instance now that's, that's threatening to, to, to leave the state. But also new businesses. I mean, there, I think there's a real issue with small businesses having a, you know, difficulties. What would you do, create a pool? I'm trying to get to a specific, something yeah. that people can sink their teeth into. You create a pool of money, you know, yeah. there's a, some kind of a, a new bureaucracy you want to set up. Right, let's, reform, let's reform the commerce, the commerce Department. Because? Let's direct it back into Rhode Island so that the staff we have there that's looking outward and looking to create these bridges into industry, well, a portion of that staff should be looking to create opportunity and, frankly, a, a sustainable uh, kind of machine whereby Rhode Islanders can go through that machine and create solutions. You mentioned corruption in, in your announcement. What are you going to do about corruption? I'm going to confront it head on. How? Oh, so... Uh, are, you the, are you running for the attorney general or for the governor's office? Well, there's all types of corruption, um, and, and certainly uh, I don't... Uh, aim to overlap with the Attorney General, but the corruption I'm talking about is, is access, right? I, I think, and I've had this experience, uh, there are operatives that don't really care who wins. It's about whether you're going to play with them. And for those individuals, they should worry about me because I'm not going to play with them. Lobbyists? Political players, I mean, political, strate of, political strategists, I mean, that, that pool of people that are in the, the economy of politics, is that who you're talking about? A combination of both. Uh, lobbyists, and in some cases they may sit on, on certain boards that they've been allotted, but I think what, what I'm saying is it's not a matter of not communicating, not sitting across the table from uh, groups and negotiating things, because ultimately we all need to have a conversation. What I'm talking about are the individuals that completely displace uh, what's going on with families and the needs of families for their own sake or for their own advancement. Those individuals have no place in government and they won't have a seat at the table. Something happened to you in your, in your building of your business that you saw this, it crystallized? From, uh, business gives you experience of some tough uh, characters, but, uh, but actually, you know, the past year as I've been engaging in uh, this kind of silent tour, I've, I've encountered some individuals that, that gave me a sense of what's available in, in the context of corruption. And in other I, words, you're talking you're talking about running and they're talking about accessing you well, to their benefits? You know, they're ultimately no, I don't think it's so much I, I think it's do this and show us that you're with us. You know, in general commentary. Oh play the game. Play the game. Gotcha. All play right, we game. come back, we're gonna speak of playing the game. I want to know what he thinks about the Paw Sox deal and a couple other key <laughs> issues and you know, what's the structure of this campaign? All in four minutes time. We'll get to it. make a case with the House, with Mattiello, with, all, with Speaker Mattiello and the members to try to bring this democratic process with a, with a small d to the, to the forefront. We're going to continue to educate people on basic fundamental economics and show them that A, government shouldn't be involved in altering private markets, and B, why stadiums simply are not the panacea that Mayor Grebian would like to present them as, their failures. All right, some of the debate we had on Friday, quickly, a couple hitters, uh, Paul Sox Stadium deal, your thought? If the people want it, 
fine. If oh, it's, if God, it's, choke me with now, this. Now, you and the Speaker of now, the House, how do we know if the people want yeah, it? Yeah, so, so, well, exactly. So l l let's take a step back. If it's not the case that we put it out to the people, ultimately what I want to see is that every soda pop, every hot dog, every, one third of the parking lot has Rhode Island food trucks, Rhode Island businesses, because ultimately how do we know that there's going to be a return for Rhode Islanders if they're not, Rhode Island businesses aren't vested in that opportunity. Otherwise, I, I just analyze the situation based on comparables in other states. And what that data shows me is that it's likely not going to be successful. So how can we make it so that what we're What data are you comparing? The International League, uh, the, the, the teams that, the, that are most comparable are, are flush, uh, and they've put in less money than the Pawsox are planning to do so for this particular stadium. Again, if you look at just the statistics around viewers, baseball, I mean, how the Pawsox have performed in, in, in recent years in the old stadium, I don't see how there's a significant return immediately that's going to give back to Rhode Island. Maybe in the long term, the, the, when you project numbers out in business, they always work out in your favor if you want them to. But what's the immediate return for Rhode Island businesses and Rhode Islanders? And outside the of decades of quality of life and, and benefit to the state, and yeah, so, so you don't, I don't disagree so, with if, it. If they fly the coop, you don't think that's a hit to the, to the long-term psychology of this place? Well, what I'm saying is, before we jump to saying that they're leaving, why don't we? restructure negotiation that in the short term has some favorability to Rhode Island businesses. I mean, we have a food culture in Rhode Island. I don't see I'm why. Sure, I'm not sure it doesn't. I mean, yeah, I'm, right. uh, have, you, have you studied well, the, you're right. the there's not that proposal there's and all of the things that they're proposing? Anyway, come back on that yeah, later. I, of course. You know, we don't have enough time. Okay. Um, any other key issue other than just saving families and jobs that, that, that you think is striking yes. for you? Yes. Public schools are falling apart. Um, you know, and, and we're giving... She's going to tell you about huge hundreds of millions of dollars of bonding here to try to fix that problem. Yeah, after there's a, hu a, a large bond extended to a private education university in the state, which part of that was used to pay back the previous debt, I feel like a lot of this is just campaign politics. I mean, what has happened over the past four years to have avoided Central Falls High School ceiling falling down or other high schools in Providence closing down? Hmm. The one thing is talking. I will act in a way that will help public schools. How do you finance this candidacy? Are you going to have any uh, real dough to do this? Or, and how are you yeah. going to generate it? Yep. So uh, what I've learned in business is a lot of people commit to helping. I've certainly had people say that they're committing to helping, but when the money's in the bank, we'll know. Well, you can't, you can't I, and I say this um, accurately and respectfully, you can't run on your good looks. So uh, you're going to raise seven figures? You have a plan to do that? I believe I can. Otherwise, you're whistling Dixie, and you've been a very nice man to meet, and good <laughs> luck to you. I wouldn't be running if I didn't think I could raise seven figures. So you're serious about building that kind of a structure? I'm serious. That kind I'm of serious about winning. I am. All right. Well, we're serious about talking with you. So the nice thing about being an independent is that you've got some running room, right? You're going to watch the primary season and, and see if you can sneak out the back door or in the back. It's kind of like, you know, independence. They go this way, you know, November. <laughs> October, November will be the hot moments. We'll see you before that, I hope. Thank you. Uh, nice to meet you. Good luck. Nice to meet you as well. Fascinating. Hey, we need fresh faces. Final word when we come back. Stay with us. Tomorrow, uh, Giovanni Ferrosi, uh, the former CEO of Alex Anani and Benris, one did well, one did not. And Gio and I have had some tough conversation about some of his, I think, pretty cocky representations on social media over the last couple of weeks. So uh, be tuned here tomorrow for a pretty honest nose to nose conversation with Giovanni Ferrosi. All right, see you on the radio at 3 tomorrow, too. We'll talk about the state of the state or the budget or whatever the heck that thing is, the governor did tonight. You have a great evening. Good night.